Because I've only seen you with a cigar with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and today I am in Sand Hollow, Utah uh, for UTV Takeover 2022. And uh, it's been pretty great weather here. It's been a pretty awesome time getting out to see people and uh, go riding. And uh, yesterday I got the chance to ride uh, with a new uh, group to our industry, um, Craftworks Off-Road. And today I'm joined uh, with the, the owner. What the owner, owner? Yeah. Uh, of Craftworks Off-Road, Craftworks USA, um, uh, Dave Shu. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Craftworks, uh, give us a lowdown on that real quick, on what that is, and then uh, we'll, we'll dive into some backstory. Okay, so Craftworks, the actual meaning of the word Craftworks in German is uh, power plant, power factory. And we make uh, supercharger and turbocharging kits for side-by-sides. And we're also coming out with uh, other products like exhausts and uh, connecting rods, head studs, ported heads, intake manifolds, things like that. So the full performance upgrade to uh, mostly naturally aspirated motors and, and getting them to their full potential. Uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't gone into the Can-Am space yet, or we haven't started modifying any of the vehicles that come turbocharged. Um, just because there's so many people doing it. Right. Um, we're here to provide a solution for... You know, people that are running naturally aspirated and want that extra oomph to keep up with their buddies that might have a turbocharged vehicle. Right. Yeah. And so uh, this is not something uh, like overnight you decided to, to start putting together. Uh, give us a little history about yourself. Uh, tell us, you know, where you grew up, what you got you into automobiles and, and where that led you. Oh, where I grew up. I grew up in uh, the central coast of California. There's a nice little city called San Luis Obispo. <laughs> And uh, San Luis Obispo, people might in the off-road industry might know it because it's uh, 10 miles from the Pismo Dunes. Pismo Beach. Yeah. Yeah. So off-road, growing up off-road for me was going to Pismo with the buddies and or beat up trucks or Jeeps. And right. you know, back then people were riding three-wheelers and driving Odyssey, <laughs> driving Odysseys and Pismo. And uh, that was always fun. It was just pure, pure teenage fun back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then in high school, started getting into cars, and then I was actually trained uh, as as an architect uh, in in college. So you went to school for architecture. I went to school for architectural design, and you know, there's design and engineering as well. Right. Um, and I ended up pivoting into the automotive industry when I was 25. So well, that's I just pretty quick of, turnaround. Yeah, it, I had the opportunity to get in the automotive industry, and I was just like. Now's the time to try because right. it's such a radical pivot from being an architect and right. having to go to work every day, day in a shirt and tie type of thing. You know? Right. Yeah. So, so what, what, when you say you went to automotive, what, what was that trigger and what, what kind of niche were you going into? So like in high school and stuff, we were always modifying cars. So cars was always in the background as a hobby. And then like, like car club culture or like just you and your buddies in the garage, buddies or? in the garage, rebuilding, you know, Volkswagen bugs. I think a lot of, a lot of people that come from my generation, <laughs> I, I, I guess that kind of, that kind of dates me and ages me. Um, you know, we were modifying Volkswagen bugs and I remember, you know, dropping engines out on skateboards. You jack the back of the car up and you drop right. the engine out of the, on a skateboard and we be rebuilding engines <laughs> in a driveway on a piece of cardboard that we pulled out with a skateboard. Right. You know, so it starts out like that. And you know, that, that car was so easy to touch and work on that you weren't afraid. You couldn't really mess it up too bad. And right. if you did, it wasn't like crazy expensive because VW parts are everywhere available. You know? Right. And then, um, my first car after that was, uh, my dad handed me down a Datsun 280Z. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that that's just, quite the hand down. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was pretty beat up, but that just kind of put me on the, the Japanese import performance path. Right. Right. Went to college, was trying not to mess with cars while in, in design school, but ultimately ended up messing with cars, going to track <laughs> days. And at, at that time, you know, I was driving a Honda Civic and after college went to work in the architecture field overseas and had opportunities I met a bunch of vendors, like factory people and different Asian-based performance companies. Um, and I met someone who gave me an opportunity to sell parts that he designed. And I'm like, well, 
now's the time to give it a try. Right. You know, before I went into architecture grad school, I'm like, I can try it out if it fails, then I'll just go back to architecture grad Always school. Always fall back on it. Right. It's been 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm going back to architecture grad school. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were uh, going into selling the parts, did you, or, did you have a mindset to someday make your own parts? Or was it, this is just an opportunity, we'll see where it goes? Yeah, it was an opportunity to see where it goes. Um, it was kind of cool to see manufacturing that early on in my 20s. That's a, that's a perspective most people don't have ever, let alone that early on. Yeah, it, I mean, back in those days, CNC controlled machining was space age rare. Yeah. I mean, I, most of our original drawings are on napkins and doodles on pieces of paper that somebody would convert into 2D CAD. So right. that's what the, that's what design was like, you know, almost 30 years ago. So so at what point? So so where did that lead to? Like, so you start vending products. Obviously, you have to start becoming kind of a marketer in that scene for that. Uh, you start investing in probably some builds and things like that. Kind of what was your approach to that? Well, I was always building cars. So there's always that uh, technical background um, that was just in the background. And um, initially, when I started the company, it was a distribution company. I was selling other people's parts, uh, right. NOS or you know whatever, like whatever parts were available back then. I was just reselling it. And... It just got to the point where I'm just like, I, w I think I can make better parts. And also, it, the the margins are, are lower in distribution, too. So it, right. it's very competitive. You're, you're, you're scratching and clawing for 1% or 2%. Right. And I, and I realized the only way I could change that paradigm was to actually design and manufacture the parts myself. Um, what was the first product that you were like, that can be done better if I would just invest my time into that? Kind of the the product that changed everything initially was coilover spring kits. Really? So you, it was the suspension side that kind of... It was actually you. the suspension side. And the, what I mean by coilovers, like right now we're so used to seeing full coilovers, right? right. In the automotive space, in the off-road space, it's all full coilovers. But back in those days, you'd take your Tokiko or your KYB shock and you put a sleeve on top of it, a threaded <laughs> right. sleeve on top of it. You convert it. Right, you convert it. And so that was like the, the budget way for coilovers because there weren't many coilovers for cars back then. Right. Any, any coilovers were used in like full professional racing and, you know, when, when and you... And limited uh, variety, right? Like very specific sizing and everything else. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're limited to the, the dimensions of the stock replacement strut or right. the shock. Yeah. So, so how did that progress into more products? Was that, was that a hit right away or did you have to kind of grind through that? No, that, that was an unexpected hit. Um, I, I think the first time I imported about 400 sets and they were gone in like two weeks. And then I kept increasing the volumes and then they kept selling out almost bef before they even arrived. I mean, the bottleneck was literally putting them in boxes and right. wa waiting for the product. Right. Right. And um, that was the, the first one that gave me the opportunity, the first product that... Uh, generated enough revenue where it gave me the opportunities to do more of the things that I... It opened up the doors. Right. Like, m it opened up... The suspension stuff opened up the doors for the engine stuff. Right. Yeah. And so, what was the, the mindset going into the motor? Was it like, I just want to develop some bolt-ons that just make things better? Or was it like, I'm, I'm going to have this end goal of full performance, you know, product sets? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it was always full performance. Like our first engine product was an adjustable timing gear. And, you know, that's to dial in your cams. And many people don't even understand that concept. Right. You know? So adjustable timing gears. And then the next product I make, made after that was an intake manifold. But there was no billet CNC machining back then. Um, like it, I said, it was space age back then. Yeah, it was like... To even be able to afford it. It was to make... You had to make molds for the castings. Right. And the molds were based off of 2D drawings. <laughs> and then you had, you know, really good mold makers make right. the stuff based off of 2D drawings. Right. You know, CAD's changed the game there. Completely, but yeah. It, it was pretty crazy because that was the first, in, like, the real major investment into engine performance at that time. And it was a 18-month development cycle to make that first tool and, and pull those first parts out. And that's not actually very long in, the, in that world of, of development and design and, and motor work and things like that. 18 months is actually pretty quick. Well, this day and age, we can have a billet manifold in a month. 
well, yeah, <laughs> we live know. in the space age now. Yeah, so. yeah. But uh, I remember talking to some folks back a long time ago, and they were talking, you know, it took two, three years to get something to market. And yeah. uh, and so you're right on that cusp of the, even just the manufacturing technology changing. So um, you went into creating these performance parts. How was the culture? Uh, and we're talking automotive right now, yeah. uh, streetcar type stuff. Um, how did the culture change? Because, I mean, that was a big change in the culture scene from just guys in the garage to being actually like groups of people that went out and did stuff together. Yeah, the 90s, you know, I'm, just, I'm going to refer to it as Japanese import performance. And in the 90s, it was actually a pretty small crowd. Right. Right? I mean, by the time everybody became aware of it in Fast and the Furious days, <laughs> right. it already ballooned into something that it wasn't. Right. Like, it was not true to its core by the time the Fast and the Furious movie came out because right. that was just all this clear taillights and cheesy, <laughs> cheesy wing type of stuff. Right. Right. And we just, we just... It started out with small car clubs, street racing, right? Right, and then it became more and more popular, and then the movie started to feed that beast, and it became just real. I don't even know how to explain it. It was kind of like a cool kids club. Like if you if you wanted to be seen, you were at those shows with a car and doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. So so you got into the performance side, and we're not talking. And so early on, we're talking about you know a couple hundred horsepower, something like that. Oh, gains even, yeah, gains over, even. right? And not, then, yeah, and then. And then that progressed into much bigger numbers. What was that transition? Um, so if you're talking the, in, the first intake manifold that we made or maybe the first camshaft that we made, I mean, you're talking maybe 25, 30 horsepower gain over an engine that started out with 180 horsepower, something like that. Right. I mean, it wasn't like spectacular. Right. And um, we didn't have many resources back then. Right. Like, where do you go look for Japanese import performance uh, tech knowledge in the 90s well you can only go to japanese car magazines but <laughs> if you can't read japanese you're kind of left trying to interpret pictures pictures yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know so it all the people that were in that scene originally they all kind of went through this process and what we started to see over time with it's the japanese have one way of doing it and then americans we have a different approach right <laughs> japanese approach to tuning is very conservative right and then the americans always want to go balls to the walls and max stuff out well when you max stuff out the the weak link is always going to be the next thing that breaks right right so you could say that in, in, in <laughs> shout out to brant and his train horns <laughs> yeah good timing bud um you can say in terms of japanese import performance it was a long evolution that really kind of tracks to manufacturing technology as well as um, material science like the biggest gains that we've seen in, in performance in the last 30 years are all resulting from computer technology as well as material. Yeah, the, the, the quality, the materials, what they can put up with, the heat cycle they can go with, the, the abuse that they can put up with. Right. It's changed drastically. People right. don't realize how drastic of a change we've had over the last 15, 20 oh, yeah. years. Yeah, like turbo technology in the 90s was like, it, it was a big deal to go 10 seconds in the quarter mile. Right. Now they're going sevens. Right. And... In the Honda cars with no wheelie bars, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so what was uh, kind of the turning point on? On, I mean, we talk about the material science that goes into these parts, and that then pushes people into pushing the boundaries with those parts. Um, was there a was there like a an upshoot where it became like was there a manufacturer that came out with something that all of a sudden you were like putting out six hundred horsepower? No, I think it's a slow progression. It's a gradual pro progression. If you're talking about the max horsepower numbers, then it's all about how quickly they're improving the power adder, whether it's the supercharger or the turbocharger. Right. Um, turbo technology has changed a lot just from being able to model the the, the aerodynamics. So you can use uh, of the of the of the propeller and the impeller and all yeah, that. Yeah, of the compressor wheel and the turbine. Um, you can run it through CFD optimization programs that will optimize the flow and then you can also do material analysis to make sure it doesn't break and that that science is like was black magic in the early days like people even just coming on board to like trusting it was it was a thing yeah i mean obviously you would have to be a big company with lots of engineers and big computers to even process that right like computational fluid dynamics cfd i mean formula one teams run that and they have to partner up with HP or these people that make massive server farms Super to even do the calculations. Right. You know, like we have more computing power in our iPhones now 
than all of the computers in the co- that I had in the company in the right. 90s combined. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so everybody's outgunning me with their iPhone right now. <laughs> so the so so the the engineering side of this becomes more of a, a common day thing where people are saying we need to invest in this, we need to push this forward, we want to make something new and different. Um, and, and in the streetcar scene that you were in at that time, was there anything that influenced the trajectory you went towards? like current day where you're starting to expand into different markets and do different types of vehicles. Was there something that pushed you over that ledge? Um, so our, our, the company is group a engineering. That's our, our, our parent company. And, you know, we started out in the import performance market and we started making forced induction kits. And that's when we created the Craftworks brand in, in actually 2008. So prior to coming into the off-road space, I mean, we've already sold, you know, thousands of supercharger kits for, for Japanese street vehicles. Uh, about four years ago, we decided to make a kit for the Razor, uh, the Pro XP, you know, and just, just to do it. Right. And that just kind of opened the flood, floodgates, right? <laughs> because, it, you know, in the last four years of the UTV market, you know, right, has been pretty h- explosive. Huge change, right? Yeah. So probably a year and a half ago, I'm just like, yeah, we got to go all in on this. Like the razor stuff was the razor stuff initially, because we're, we're focusing on car stuff. The razor stuff was sort of the redheaded stepchild, right? Because we didn't, we didn't know people in the off-road space. It's, it's completely different. Whole different community. Yeah. It's completely different enthusiast community, completely different marketing channel, completely different sales channels. Right. And, um, I'm like, we identified, that the UTV space was essentially the 90s import performance market 2.0. Right. Right. A lot of people now probably don't even understand the ni- what the 90s market was like, but I'm telling you the UTV space right now maps to that experience that we had, shoot, almost 30 years ago. Right. Yeah. And that, that comes from a, a passionate community pushing something forward, and then all of a sudden people getting in the right seats, the right businesses, the right chair spots, whatever, to start throwing money at it and then developing new programs. And, you know, Polaris was one of the, you know, pioneers in the mass market performance off-road vehicle market, uh, not to put down Yamaha or those guys, but uh, to, to have a mass market, you know, 1,000 cc motor or whatever. Um, and then, you know, basically, as soon as somebody goes all in, then everybody else wants to go all in. And then we saw yeah. Can-Am and everybody else come on board. Um, and so what was your first impressions getting into these off-road motors because you're coming from familiar territory, but diff- but the products are, they look a bit different. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> Quite simply, it's easier. I'm used to, I'm used to four, six and eight cylinders and in the UTV space right now, with the exception of the pro R, you know, it's two and three cylinders. So I'm, I'm either, uh, uh, it's as co- uh, one quarter is quant complicated to one half is complicated right. basically, <laughs> you know? So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so when you guys got into your first development platform, it was the XP 1000 XP 1000 or, and the, then, or the pro XP. Uh, which one is it? I'm not even sure. I think it's, <laughs> X, I think it's a, a one th- XP 1000. No, it's not, right, right. it's not, not the pro XP. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't really look at the, the chassis of the vehicle, the individual so car or whatever, you're looking at the motor. I'm looking at the engines, and yeah. you know, I'm I'm confused with how many engines this uh, uh, this I, I'm confused with how many chassis this actual Polaris engine is in. <laughs> it's like in eight different things, right? Right. So, so it, it would have been an XP 1000. Yeah. And then when we identified this market was the 90s market, I'm like, okay, we're going all in on this, and we immediately bought the YXZ, we bought the Honda Talon, the KRX, you know, and we got the Pro R. And I think it's unavoidable, but we're going to have to do the Can-Am as well. Right. Yeah. And like you said, you were, you were recognizing that the performance brands that were out there already were kind of all in on Can-Am because it had the bigger power plant, higher horsepower from the factory. Yeah. Uh, they kind of set up for the tuners right from the get-go. Um, but you recognized the rest of the naturally aspirated market really didn't have any development engineering investment into making those more capable yeah um and so that's you you recognize the xp 1000 uh some potential there uh what's the focus on developing these platforms i mean you, you said you have all the cars and we we've, we've been out and we've looked at them and we'll get into that but the but the idea behind developing a system for these cars that really weren't engineered from the factory to be high horsepower 
they're they're kind of like an uh, an entry level vehicle. Um, what's your what's your focus? How do you guys approach it? And what what do you guys uh, what's your intention with these products on those motors? Well, if we stay true to the name, we're the power factory, right? <laughs> and every vehicle could use more power. Absolutely. And you know, the Can-Am space is obviously the most crowded power space. Right. But then if you talk about Talon and YXZ and, and Razor, it seems like there's a power vacuum. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of people doing power stuff. I mean, I'm not talking about exhaust. Exhaust is like bolt-on stuff. Yeah. It's not really power right. stuff, you know? Um, so we're, we're just there to uh, supply the arms to all sides in this great UTV battle that they're right. having. You know, everybody wants more power. And and it's not that you're coming at it from an angle of like we're going to dominate the racing scene. It's more about providing that that extra value to the consumer in a vehicle that they've already purchased. I'm providing the pieces that you need to dominate whatever space that you choose to dominate. Right. So um, just just kind of let you know what sort of things we're working on now. I mean, I, I've I've developed all the camshafts for all of these vehicles. We're just getting ready to go into production with this stuff. Your own camshafts. Our own camshafts. Right. And uh, unlike, you know, different cam companies in, I'm not even limit this to the import performance space, but the UTV space, even even the modern muscle space, a lot of regrinders, people that are just taking catalog grinds and say, oh, I want grind 413 on this cam, right? It doesn't work like that. You got to design it from the cylinder head geometry. So... Like when we do a, a camshaft, we measure the head first and we look at all the numbers and then we design within the numbers. We design within dynamic limits and, and mechanical limits. You're not just simply taking um, a, a, a lift value and then modifying it. You're saying the, the entire lope of that cam needs to be designed from the head up. Well, if you if you like, if we're going to go camshaft tech, this 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 is a slippery slope. Oh, let's get nerdy. Slope. I'm all about yeah, nerdy. Okay. <laughs> so if we talk about camshaft tech. Uh, you know, camshaft is generally defined by the, the duration, which is the two points on the bottom, and then the lift, which is the top point. The peak. So it, that describes a triangle. Right. Lift curves are not triangles. They're, they're little hill-shaped things that, are, that you know, I, I, I'm, tr I'm, I'm visualizing a valve lift curve, which basically looks like, you know, you've seen the yeah. cam charts. They look like a little hill. Right. Well, the triangle is just three points of that hill. Right. That hill can have really steep slopes. Have a really round, flat top. Have a really razor top. I'm using UTV language. There you here. go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I see what you did there. <laughs> yes, got that. <laughs> you know, so so within those three points, you have an infinite amount of different valve lift curves that you can put in there. Well, what defines the limits of the valve lift curve is the mechanical limits of the cylinder head, like the valve springs that you're using, and uh, you know the the valve train style and the valve train geometry. These are all things that play play a factor in it. And then, uh, again, as materials improve, you can push those limits more. Right. So, like, even in, like, NHRA, pro stock racing, or whatever form of racing, the biggest gains in camshaft design have been materials as well. And it's not so much the materials of the camshaft, but the materials of the valve springs. Right. You know? Yeah. Because you're talking about a very uh, beefy component, something that has a lot of mass to it, in, rel in relative to a rod end or a whatever, and uh, we all know that we can pull some of these engines apart and see some pretty tinsy little pieces in there. Uh, beefing those up has usually been just the answer is like, just make it bigger. But, but you're actually saying we're going to change the material and the geometry of those components to be optimized for this specific, specific right. so, package. So the, going back to our little razor top triangle hill, you know, if you, the, bigger flat, the bigger and rounder your cam profile is, the more demands it's going to place on the valve spring. So what has changed in valve spring technology is the materials. If you have higher tensile strength uh, materials, then you can get bigger lifts into the, you know, the same area because right. you, could, you could pull the pitch out on, on, on the valve spring. You know, the number of coils, you could reduce the number of coils so the right. bind height is lower, right. so you have steeper angles. Well, you need to have very good materials to do that. Otherwise... Especially you, if we wanted to cycle for many, many, many runs. Right, right. So it's, it's all material science... Heat treatments, that's really advanced everything from camshafts to turbochargers to superchargers. So when I get into 
a hobby or an interest or whatever, I'll find these little niches of, of nugget information that I go down these deep, deep rabbit holes on. I, have, I feel like material science is that for you. Like you can see, you can see what's needed, what's, what's available and know that there's an answer or a solution or, or, or trying to find one. Material science is just one piece of the rabbit hole. <laughs> you know, that's one corner of the, of the 20 sided rabbit hole, right. you know? Um, but yeah, you got to keep, you have to keep on top of that stuff. Like what's the most current materials, what different heat treating technologies are available, what surface treatments, uh, what coatings. These are all things that... People would be surprised how many coatings and surface treatments are inside a motor. Like, people, they just, they just see metal yeah. on a table. They're like, oh, that's the upgrade, right? Yeah. They don't understand that there's a lot of wearable components within that, too, yeah. that make a difference. Right. Uh, we, I mean, the most common thing people would talk about would maybe be, um, you know, uh, uh, gaskets or rings or something like that. That's the consumable to them. Yeah. But there's actually a lot of science around the coatings and the finishes to those products. Yeah. So I, I'll give you an example. Like um, Chevy's new Z06 Corvette yeah. has an engine that you don't need to adjust. Did you know that? On the C8? C7, C, yeah, the C8, the Z06. Yeah. And the, the, is it Z06? Z06, Z06, Z07? Yep. Right? It's because they're using different heat treatments and they're using different coatings. And I believe that engine is probably almost everything is covered with diamond like carbon coating. You know, GM's claiming you don't ever need to do a valve adjustment on it. And, mm. it's, and it's not a hydraulic system. Mm. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a mechanical system where there's lash clearances and stuff like that. Right. They're, essentially, that claim is saying none of the valve train will wear over time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a uh, again going back to that that claim of space age technology, right? Like this is all stuff we dreamt of, you yeah. know, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. Yeah, uh, and we're starting to see some of that. Even something as simple as a shock, right? Like Fox on their shocks has some super secret coding stuff that they got going on in there. And you know, like you look at a Walker Evans car, it's like it's not going to have that, so it wears and heats completely different than a Fox shock. Uh, and so the, there's there's a lot of costs involved in that uh, that uh, you're paying for when you pay for the upgrade and the, and the high quality parts. Um, and so when you get into the UTV space and you're looking at the motors and you're tearing them down, um, does does your design process just go for all the components and you just you just see the future of those coming out, or is it we're going to focus on this one thing, make that happen, make it as best as we can, and move it to the next thing? Well, the, the black mag magic in the engine is really the cylinder head and the camshafts, right? Uh, after, after you get that dialed down, it's just making stuff hold together. So when we, when we say your, your, your vehicle needs pistons and it needs rods and it needs head studs, those are just mainly stronger components. Going from a cast piston to, you know, a 2618 forge piston, it's just a stronger material that's going to hold up to more power. Yeah, there's some advancements in the skirts and the ring packs and all of that stuff, and you will gain from that. But that isn't where you're going to make the biggest gains. You're going to make the biggest gains, obviously, on the power adder, right? right? The intake manifold, the exhaust manifold. But what's in the middle of all that? It's the camshaft and cylinder head. So, so I kind of like say the cylinder head is like, uh, engine's just an air pump, right? Right. And the last door you have to go through is the valve. Right. So you, how big is the hallway, the intake port that leads to the valve? Right. And how long is that revolving door open for, for the air to go in? And then same thing on the exhaust side. Right. So I'm trying to explain it in like simple metaphor, but that is the bottleneck of any engine. You right. could put a big turbo on there, but if you have a small intake ports and small exhaust ports and you can't get it out, you're just going to cook the thing. You right. Know? So. so when you take a look at putting a supercharged kit onto these two and, and four cylinders and, and maybe in the future three cylinders, um, you know, what's the, what's the process of saying, you know, are we just going to dyno this thing and then, and then just start tweaking? Or is it a process of like, we have so much knowledge in this, we're going to, we're going to change X, Y, and Z and then see what that does. So in the automotive space, the first thing that I go after is the camshaft and the cylinder head, because there's so many people doing all the other stuff. Like in, in, in import performance tuning, there's so many people doing bespoke turbo kits and supercharger setups and compound turbo setups and twin turbo or, or twin charging setups, like whatever. That's like people can do whatever they want to do there. But ultimately, the bottleneck is still going to be the camshaft and the cylinder head. Like they can do all that other crap, but if they don't open up the last door, right? that stuff was just not going to be very efficient. So like in the import, not many people can do that. And so the import space is like, if, so for example, on 
the new Honda Type R. I designed a camshaft for that, and it picked up like 80 horsepower because the, the, the engine's already forced induction. Right. So it just made everything more efficient. Right. The side-by-side stuff was actually the opposite because I know it's 1,000 cc, right? right. So the, the amount of gain, if it's 10 or 20%, is still based off of 1,000 cc. Right. And everybody wants big numbers. Everybody's right. mindset is not like, oh, my cam only makes five or 10. You know, they want 40. They want 50. Right. Well, I can't do that with just a cylinder head and a cam. Right. So let's put a power adder on it. So the UTV approach is almost exactly the opposite is how we approached it in the automotive uh, performance space. Because, uh, you know, that I'm going for, for the bottleneck. And this one I'm going, it's like, it, it's a thousand cc engine. It's, it's not, always it's going to be. It's not living to its potential yet. It's always going to be a bottleneck. Yeah. Because it's so small, right? And it doesn't have many cylinders. So let's force it through there. So it's a different, <laughs> it's a different mindset. And it's kind of funny because after we've developed the turbo kit for the Talon and, and all the supercharger kits for the other vehicles, now I'm like, okay, let's do, let's do the cylinder heads and the cams now. Right. And build the you short block. You fix that problem. Now address this problem. Yeah. And then we'll build up, build up the short block and then we'll turn the power up on the power adder. Right. You know, so we, slightly different approach, but to the, it's a, leads to the same ends. Right. Which is maximum efficiency. And so let's talk a little bit about the kit. So let's talk about the original kit, the XP1000 setup. Uh, this is a bolt-on kit that goes right on the right on the motor without having to tear out the head and, and all that yep. stuff. You're not doing internals with the with the base kit, right? Yeah. Like you're saying, anybody can really add this to their their system without having to really tear down their motor and, and do a lot of questionable work by yourself or by a dealer. Um, you actually can just rely on the, the efficiency of bolting it on yeah. and seeing what the performance gains are. Yeah, so our approach on that was we, we kind of look back to how turbo kits first came into the, the, the Honda import tuning space. And I remember buying these turbo kits and it was just parts in a brown box. Right. And it was like, what do we do with this stuff? And the people who figured out what to do with this stuff actually created whole cottage industries of installations of these things, right? So we kind of already went through that process one time of knowing like, okay, factory pistons or their hyper eutectic castings, how much power can they hold, right? So we're kind of like, okay, most of the pistons between eight and 10 horsepower, as long as you aren't too, or eight, eight and 10 um, PSI, as long as you aren't too aggressive on the timing, the hyper eutectic piston will hold together. And if you want to push further than that, or if you want to rack more timing into it, then you need to change the piston out. Right. So what we wanted to do was create a kit that was easy to install where people didn't have to go through the pains of trying to figure out 100 parts in a brown box. So our kits come with, you know, 50 page color instructions. And if you follow them to the T and then we got customer support people to help you with the install process, we really wanted to make it D DIY possible. Right. You now, anybody it, it comes complete. So you can go in your garage, and if you follow, follow the instructions, you know, you could probably install any of our kits in about six to eight hours. Yeah. You know? And well, you're, you're not risking anything by doing it. Like, it's, yeah. you're, not, you're not opening the door to failure because it's still leaving the reliable motor where it was. Right. Right. So we definitely, our base kits are designed to be within the, re the reliable operation parameters of the stock pistons, which is the weak link. The stock pistons and the stock rods typically are the weak link for, for kits like this. And then our mentality was we want to make it easy to install. Um, so the more kits people install, the more that knowledge starts to build up. Right. Right. We didn't, we understand how much we suffered with a hundred parts in a brown box to shake it up and like, <laughs> how's this shit go on there? You know? So we, we want to cut through that and make it a better experience for, for, for customers to install kits. And then we want, we didn't want to create kits where you have to cut and weld and fab and move stuff around. And that's what scares people. Right. So our kits by design is like, you might remove a piece of plastic or trim off a corner of a plastic or hole saw a hole through plastic. You don't have to weld anything. You don't have to do any of that. Any drilling uh, that you might have to do to the, to let's say it might just be drill an extra hole here in this tab that already exists as opposed right. to like weld a, a new bracket onto the, your roll cage. And so it's designed to be really easy. Yeah. So the, the kits that we went and looked at, you know, there, you can see, all the, the pulleys that have been added and you can see the belt and everything. 
Um, does that also have a, a shroud for it and everything, or is it kind of left open? No, no. A actually, the what you saw there, they took the cover off so people right. could see it. But it, it's an environmentally sealed cover, and then you can remote vent it. So the stuff is designed so we, we know people submerge these things. Yeah. Yeah, so we designed a cover so that can be So all you eastern and southern guys, listen up. This is a sealed system. It's not an exposed system. It's a sealed system, and it has remote vents. And, and you know, our normal vent line probably comes up to shoulder height. But if you're going to submerge it, like I've seen guys that are driving through bogs with just their eyeballs poking out. Oh, yeah. Out. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, God damn. <laughs> you know? it's like, I'm like, if that's how they're using it, we have to design it for that. Or right. we have to make an upgrade for them to be able to do that. So we actually modified the oil reservoir that, uh, that the, the superchargers that we have have an oil reservoir and it has a vented cap. So we had to come up with a, like a retrofit where if, you, or if you're gonna submerge the reservoir, then you, this is how you add the, the vent line. And once you add the vent line, the system's completely sealed to above your head. Wherever you take it. Right. If you put the vent line at, at the top of your roll cage, then you would need a scuba res respirator to drive this thing underwater. Right. And yeah. there's a lot of guys that do a lot of water and mud and all that stuff um, on that side of the country. And uh, that's, that's the common thing that I hear is like, we want the turbo power, but we don't want the 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 blow off valve exposed to, to atmosphere and, and all these other things that potentially could cause problems uh with their system and then you talk about alternator kits and things like that they're always like that's not going to survive in the mud yeah you know this is where the the knowledge and the r d and the time invested to make these things universally acceptable on the machines yeah um yeah it's, it's, like the first time i saw one of our krx kits go through the mud i'm just like okay you know, we got to design for this stuff. We have to keep it in mind. Yeah. You know, um, it's one of the reasons why we mount our intercooler up in the free air. Some people mount it low. This is like, well, no, you want to keep it as high as possible. Yeah. You know? And away from the heat sources. Yeah. And so to, to be clear, your kits aren't tapping into the cooling system. You're not replacing any of that stuff or nope. any of the of the of the internal systems for the motor. It is literally a bolt on kit with some maybe some minor modifications here or there. But um, and then and then once it's installed, uh, it's just about, you know, regular maintenance of checking your belt and make things like that, where, right. uh, you know, in a, in a sealed system, it's not really a huge deal to do it every month or something. But it's definitely um, whenever whenever a belt's added, you always want to make sure that's on your calendar to to check up on just like your CVT belt and everything like that. Right. Um, so so you went from an XP 1000. And then you went into what next? Was it the the Yamahas, the Talons, the? Yeah, it was the uh, the YXZ. The the I don't think the Talon was even out back then. So we we went, went in the YXZ, and the Talon came out. We got that, and then the KRX came out. We got that, and then you know, like we were on the list for a lot of these vehicles. And then as soon as they came out, we just turned the development team on it and knocked it out. Right. And so one of the most interesting components that you are offering now is that KRX supercharger um and i can speak from experience that it it totally changes the character of the car um the com the first thing anyone will say on a krx is that it's a great car but it's underpowered and adding this this new system to it uh, not only provides enough power for you to do whatever you want to do and keep up with your turbo friends uh the the actual character of the car is now changed yeah and it's not it was funny we were out riding yesterday and I was like, hey, let's let's uh, not get too far out. We want to make sure the KRX doesn't get lost. Because out here in San Paulo, it's like you think you're on the same trail you were on, but it's a completely different yeah. trail. And and so so he's like, they're right behind us. <laughs> and I look in I look in the mirror and oh, for sure enough, the KRX. I'm not used to saying that. Well, like, well, you know what? <laughs> you, you were in a supercharged Pro R, so <laughs> trust me, they weren't on the gas on that one. No. <laughs> well, I mean, but but it's just the the nature, right? Like you're yeah. used to thinking a certain way when you're out with your buddies like right. okay let's wait for timmy he's in a little bit slower car or, yeah. or whatever but this opens the door for you to no longer be that guy and be be right there with everybody else yeah i mean that was the whole point is we want like on on the 1000 xp is like when the turbos came out it's sort of like okay well you can spend all this extra money and buy the like trade in your xp to buy the turbo right and then th that's just like throwing good money after bad why not just put a $4,500 kit? I don't even know what the exact price is, but, you know, it's probably all in sub $5,000. Right. 
and you'll be right up there with somebody who paid how much more is a turbo than an XP? It's now? usually eight to fifteen. Eight to fifteen, probably closer. You know, let's say it's somewhere in between. It's it's ten plus, right? And but. I mean, if, more than a than a naturally yeah. Right, yeah. But, and if, if you invested all this money in your XP to put whatever bells and whistles and stereos and stuff that you put on there, if you were to upgrade to turbo, you'd have to do it again. Right. <laughs> right? And we know, we know what eBay prices are for used parts, right? It's right. Like 50% off, you know? So. Yeah, so, um, so the KRX, was that... Um, any different than what you were learning on the XP stuff, or was it kind of just the same same old stuff? It was literally the same old stuff. I yeah. mean, it, easier to work on because it's a bigger chassis. It's like a small, same size motor because it's all 1,000 cc, but it, it's in a much bigger truck. Right. Right. And then um, CVT as well. Right. So. But now you cool. also have a turbo kit for the Talon, and you guys are are well versed in Honda technology. Um, and again, we're at that thousand CC, but we're on a, a DCT and we're on a, a, a different style of block and, and things like that. Um, why, why go turbo and, and not forest induction and why, why, what was different with that development process? So we've, we've never been about chasing that max power, right? And turbo is a max power gain, right? Cause ultimately you can't get a big enough supercharger on a 1,000 cc engine because it can't turn it. It has to turn it mechanically, right? So it's there's more trade-offs with that. A turbo is just exhaust gas. So the bigger turbo you put on there, the more you force it through. You know, Ultimately, you're going to have the biggest horsepower gains from a turbo. But turbos that are big don't drive well, right? right. So a supercharger having a belt-driven compressor. So the, the supercharger that we use is essentially a centrifugal uh, compressor section, which a turbo is as well. Which is what a turbo has. Right? It's just the turbo is exhaust-driven. So right. the technical term for a turbocharger is an exhaust-driven supercharger. It's not turbocharger. Right? <laughs> right. So you have a belt-driven supercharger and you have an exhaust-driven supercharger. With the belt, um, your power, your your boost is in relationship to your, your engine RPMs. Yep. So as long as the engine is turning... It's got something there. As soon as you stab it, it's there. Turbos yeah. may need a, the bigger your turbo, you, there's a little bit of, well, little or a lot of delay from when you stab it to when it fills the whole system up with a boost and then you finally feel it. Right. Right. Well, and, and the, 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 the tr I call it the translation time of, of when things start happening to when you start feeling it. That's lag. Yeah. <laughs> it's not and, translation time, it's called lag. Right. Know? But I mean, just in our, in our head, how yeah. that works, our brain doesn't actually perceive the power until you are actually feeling and in, in emotion right and and so with a supercharger that's why i've always been so so interested in superchargers was like i know if like my dad used to have hot rods back in the day and that was all supercharged because the turbo scene on american muscle just didn't have the power they were all looking for yeah, yeah it's uh it, it's power on demand a supercharger the belt driven compressor is power on demand and then within superchargers, you have positive dis displacement uh, chargers, which would be like roots blowers or twin screw blowers and things like that. Those have m even more instantaneous power, but they fall off, right? Okay. So like they reach their maximum efficiency quicker. Right. A centrifugal compressor is sort of like the efficiency goes up to the square of the wheel speed. So the faster the wheel goes, the more power it makes. A positive displacement super so uh, uh, a centrifugal supercharger the curve looks like this positive dis displacement supercharger looks like this ramps up and plateaus right so yeah. so the so when we talk about putting a super on these cars i mean are we what's the lifespan of something like that right when we talk about a turbo car there's a lot of uh maintenance involved with keeping it top notch is the same maintenance cycle or is the is the maintenance cycle the same, or is it kind of like you get a little bit more, you get the pe more power, but with the same maintenance cycle you had before? The supercharger has its own uh, internal like cooling and oiling system, so it, it turbos generate more heat, and they tax the whole engine. When you or when you're attaching that much localized heat to the engine bay, it taxes everything. Right. It it puts additional load on your cooling system and all that. Um, the supercharger is generates less heat. So because you're not using the exhaust gas. You're not and, using the exhaust gas. And, and that's the common issue with these cars, right? They, they put the turbo right behind the seat, and, and then all of a sudden your car is a walking. Yeah, it's not just the exhaust gas, because every vehicle has an exhaust on it. It all has an exhaust manifold. It's literally you're putting a restriction in there, therefore it gets it hotter 
right. than a normal header, right? Um, but I kind of we kind of got off track on why I made the talent a turbo. Yeah, yeah. Because I couldn't get a supercharger on it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was that simple, right? So normally the way that we, we uh, hook up the superchargers, we, we find a way to attach the crank on the stator side, right? But on the Talon, it's in front of the engine against the back firewall in a very tight little spot and just no room to do it. No room to, no to, room to attach. To do it. Like if I could have put a supercharger on the Talon, I would have. We couldn't. So we created a, a different animal knowing the things that we know as well. Right. And when we talk about a stock Talon, right, we're talking about a, a car that is kind of unique in that there is power there, but it's usually from the mid the mid range. Yeah. It's not at the at the low end. It's not first gear. It's not, you know, at the very top end. Um, and so what does how does the supercharger affect or the turbocharger, sorry, how does that affect the feel of that car with with first gear? Because when I've driven Tondas, I, I almost dreaded being in first gear or, or getting going up a hill or, or something because it would just bog down. Yeah. And when we talk about turbo, right, the lag part of it, like, does that make it, does the lag part get increased or does it get eliminated completely or? We, we understood this uh, teeter-totter game that you're playing there, right? So normally if you want something very responsive, you're trading off the, the top end power. Right. And if you want the top end power, then you're trading off the little bit of the response off the bottom. We went through probably three, four turbochargers just in the development of this kit to find the one that gave us the power off the bottom, but still had enough headroom for people to get, I, I believe, I don't know if anybody's done it with our kit yet, but they should be able to get about 200 to the wheel with the turbocharger that we supplied. The turbocharger that we supplied is, it's a racing turbocharger. It's a dual ceramic, ceramic ball bearing turbo with a, a, a a, a compressor, a custom compressor housing that has surge ports on it. It's like, it, it's a race turbo. Yeah. You know, and it, I could have made it a lot cheaper using a lesser turbo, you know, but because the turbo is so good, it actually has the good response off the bottom, the, like the dual ceramic bearings. It's just a more efficient turbo. Talking about material science and, and how things have progressed, that was an, I was actually going to ask you about ceramic bearings and in these units yeah. um, and how much that's changed how they perform and how they react. Because I remember uh, back in the day where, where they would spool down and it would be pretty quick. And it seems like these new ceramic setups, are, are they almost like roll for days. Yeah. Um, when, when turbos were using... Some turbos still use bushings inside, and then you can tell when you turn when you turn the <laughs> compressor wheel, it goes a couple rotations max, and it right. stops. Right? It needs the force. It's not oil. wore out. It's just that's the way that that behaves. Well, there's no there's no forced oiling in there. It's exactly it's running on a system that's essentially like a crankshaft. You have to put enough oil pressure in there to create uh, the float. Yeah, right. Uh, that's the easiest way to right to it's put floating it floating in the, to get moving. Yeah, right. um, ball bearing. Ball bearing barely needs any oil. If you over oil a ball bearing, that's not good. Right. You'll actually coke it up. Like it'll it'll start to create hardened particles inside of the bearing that actually lock the bearing up. So like on a ceramic ball bearing turbo on the Talon, we can we can run an oiling jet that's as small as a half a millimeter. So like a twenty thousandths oiling jet, that's tiny. That's nothing. That's barely any oil oil going onto that bearing. Yeah. So so high quality components on the front end allow you to not only create stability and, and longevity, but it also opens up the door for the other side of the motor when you're talking about the heads and, and the rods and all that stuff, because now that's no longer, you're just, you're eliminating the bottlenecks and the, and the, and the weak points and working your way up. Right. Through, through the improved aerodynamics. So like in turbocharger world, they talk about generations of aerodynamics of the turbine wheel and the compressor wheel. And a lot of people look at a turbine wheel and they'll be like, Oh, it looks the same if you don't know what you're looking at. But I have a friend who's who's a senior designer for Garrett, and he looks at it. Oh, this is a Generation 3 aerodynamics. Oh, that's Generation 2 aerodynamics. And these generations aren't, like, happening month after month. These were, like, maybe five to ten year spans from different generations of aerodynamics. Right. And we're not just talking, like, a cast versus a billet versus whatever. It's It's the actual engineering that goes into the dynamic the fluid dynamics of of how that's shaped and how it progresses out towards the outside the, the number of the number of wheels the inducer size the exducer size the the shape of the hub that holds the fins yeah right so sometimes you'll see like 
six fins. Sometimes you'll see 11 fins. Sometimes you'll see wavy fins. Sometimes you'll see like six big fins with like seven little fins in it or, you know, whatever. Like right. that's all aerodynamics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it can kind of look like a, a Blendtec blender sometimes, you know, with some of the crazy stuff they do. Yeah. Um, but uh, w if you're when you're looking at those, I mean, because there are such a variety of of design concepts on those, um, and we see these guys out here like drags and stuff like that, and they'll all have this exotic turbo, custom built, and all this other stuff. Um, you know, is there is there something for those, or is that more of just a niche market and and really? The reliability comes down to the quality of the materials and the and the design of of the product. You kind of got to see what you are ultimately shooting after, you know. Like the 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 highest performance turbos that we're seeing right now are probably the stuff that people are running in pro mod drag racing. I mean, big high efficiency turbos. You'll never use that on a side by side. Right. But you could take the aerodynamics and the materials, and you can make little brothers that have the same technology as these pro mod turbos. Right. Yeah. So, so the when we talk about flowing out of that and into um, the drive side of that, um, putting the power down is always a big issue for side by sides. Uh, you know, we talk about street cars and stuff. Then you start talking about your suspension. You start talking about the tires. You start talking about aero. Um, yeah. But in side by sides, you don't have things like downforce. You don't have things like you know what sticky slick are you going to use yeah. on this street versus that temperature versus that elevation or whatever. Uh, we're talking about just your tire. Most of these tires out here do a good job of getting enough traction. It's not about that. It's about how can you translate that crankshaft to the CVT and then the CVT to the trans. Um, and how are you guys approaching that? Everything's going to break at some Like, the more you push power, every, something's going to break down, down to the road, right? So if we look at it in terms of systems, you have the powertrain, mm -hmm. you have the drivetrain, and you have the suspension. The suspension is a different thing because that's handling and jumping and cornering right. and all that stuff. Getting the power to the wheels, you have to go through the powertrain through the drivetrain, right? We're prepared to go there. You know, we, 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 we've seen it happen in the Honda world where – Okay, we took these 180 horsepower engines, and now when, when we're making 500, the clutches go, the drive shafts go, and the gearboxes go, right? So if you were to look at the import performance tuning space now, it's all straight cut gears, dog boxes, you know, 300 M axles on um, Porsche 930 joints, you know? We, we've adopted a lot of off road even into, you know, the, the, the road market, right? right? Because sh bulletproof shit is bulletproof shit. Right. Right. And if we can take what we learn from making something bulletproof in one area, it's easy to adapt into another area. Right. And, and in the off-road market, we have started adopting 300 and, and various different metal and, and uh, uh, materials into our, our car, into our cars, along with geometry changes and things like that. Um, but, but ultimately speaking, you're going to end up having to focus on uh, the drivetrain. And, and the common, except for the clutched cars, uh, is the CVT. Yeah. Right. And because like on the Talon, you, you're working on the power. You're not working on the DCT yeah. right now. Right. And and so what are you guys doing to translate power? You know, we got some future product coming out things like that. What are you guys focusing on on the next step of, of translating that power to the ground? So talking about drivetrain, uh, we're coming out with a modular billet clutch setup for the Razors and the KRX. It really was just a proof of concept at first. And once we know it's bulletproof and it works as it should out in the field, then we can easily just translate it to the, the, the different platforms. Um, again, the CVT was, there was some design tweaks. So we designed our modular CVT so you can change the sheaves when the sheaves wear out. Right, and so you, a lot of kits that you get on the market now are just weights or just a spring or or whatever that's changing the way that it reacts when it clamps down and when right um but you're talking about the actual you're coming out with a component that you can swap out the actual sheave angle which is going to drastically change how those weights perform the springs perform when it where it engages where it builds up power and drops off of power right we can change the sheave angle uh you could have different materials from the actual clutch to the the sheaves because the sheaves they run hotter because you got the belt rubbing against it. Right. So you got to pick a, an aluminum material that's more resistant to heat while the actual clutch part, you could choose something that's not as resistant to heat, but is actually has a higher strength in a different operating range. Right. right? Um, the way we design the clutch is you'll be able to adjust the weights in the arms without taking the arms out. So they're all rear loading arms. And then the main spring, we made it so you could top load it out of the, 
the clutch assembly as well. So you can change mainsprings and arm weights without ever removing it from the vehicle. And, and to us, that was obvious because that's how you would do any pro stock clutch or any, any drag race car that's making power that has a sophisticated clutch. It's all adjustable on the vehicle. You don't have to right. take it out, except for like top fuel where they have to grind the disc in between <laughs> rounds and stuff like that. Right. So, so what you're talking about is a, uh, a customizable, tunable way to uh, not only upgrade, but then to future-proof in a way that you can tune to whatever comes down the road. If you, if you start with a base kit and then you move into a full build and then all of a sudden you're making way more horsepower and, and you're slipping at, at launch, like you can then utilize that investment and then capitalize on it already existing in your car and just upgrade it. Yeah, I mean, we found it... Maybe we were just solving our own pain point. Like every time we had to modify the CVT, it was like, oh, fuck, we got to take this off and we got to pull it apart. And we got, you know? And so we're just like, how do we, how do we avoid this? Right. Well, how do we design something with the mindset that let's not take it off the car? Right. Right. Cause that, especially in a, in a, in a racing scenario, you don't have time to do that. Right. You know? So, you know, we come from a racing world where you just swap out the whole engine and transmission. Well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't see many racers out here on the sand swapping motors. Yeah. So, but uh, but but basically, the idea is that you know, whenever you're designing the product and you solve your own problems, ultimately speaking, you're solving somebody else's problem. Well, we design so many products, and, and it's very important for us to have the customer feedback. Um, we we sponsor this one kid out in Alabama. You met him, yeah, Adam Brown, right? And our goal is to make it Adam Brown proof. I mean, this kid has got a talent. He goes on rocks and he's rolling this thing down. And it's like, if this guy rides it hard. Yeah. You know, I would never ride it that hard because I know how <laughs> things might break, right? Yeah. He's just like, F it. And that's a, that's a different approach from the street world where it's like on the street world, you're pretty much just going to assume it's going to stay all four down on the pavement at all times, yeah. right? We're out here. We could be... We could be hitting rocks one day. We could be jumping off stuff the next day. We could be going through mud the next day. It's not the same environment. You can't you can't design around one environment. It's also a different development approach. And I'm going to use the example of uh, heavy lift rockets. Okay, so NASA was developing heavy lift rockets, and it was more like we're going to take engine pure engineering and theory and calculations, and we're going to make these things. And you know they spent more on the calculation side. While Russian heavy rockets, when they were doing their program, they were blowing shit up. Right. Like, let's keep blowing it up until it stops blowing up. I mean, obviously, they're not going in without calculations. Right. But they're not going to keep dipping their toe in the water 600 times. Or at, at some point, they're just say, let's call it. Let's just shoot it up there. If it blows up, it blows up. Most satellites are launched using Russian heavy lift rocket engines, not right. American. You know, that's the only reason SpaceX can kind well, of Well, I was going to say, SpaceX did the same approach. They blew up a ton of rockets, a lot of money, yeah. you know, getting their stuff done. Yeah. But it was because, like you said, they just went in as fast as they could, as, as hard as they could to make it happen. And now now what we're seeing is everybody's moving to SpaceX because they've built a better product. There, There's a tendency to be, you know, when you have a lot of data and you have a lot of calculations, there's a feature creep. There, like, you know, you have an analysis paralysis and feature creep type of problems. Yeah. And ultimately, you should just dip your toe a few times and then you just grab your balls and you jump. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it's a different approach. So uh, that's, clear, that's kind of the motto for UTV in general. Just just go balls. Out. Yeah. So, so maybe we're bringing more of the NASA approach. Right. But we want to combine it with the guys that are going out there and just, you know. Sending it. Sending it. Yeah, all the time, right? Because if we can make something that lives up to that, and we have the calculation and all the engineering theory to go behind it to solve those problems, that's the that's the fastest way to the solution. I mean, e even in uh, import performance, where we're at today is, you know, built on all these broken parts <laughs> over the course of thirty <laughs> right. years. Right. You know, so. So uh, I wanted to touch just real quick on the on the Pro R. Um, you just recently started the development on that. You have a working prototype here. Yeah. Um, we've been in it. it. It's 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 not as much of a change as the KRX was. It's like not a different car, but it is you know considerably different feeling yeah. uh, than the stock version. And you're just only a couple weeks into it. You know. Yeah. Um, you know. Kind of explain some of the hurdles you went through to get that going and what that means for the future of that development. 
So from when we got the vehicle to when we had a running supercharger on there was a month, right? The actual prototyping time was probably closer to a week and a half. And then we started running into tuning issues because we're not using a standalone ECU. We're using a, a flash tuning solution called HP Tuner. And they advertised that they had one for the Pro-R. So it was like, oh, yeah, let's make a supercharger kit. And then when we put it on there, it's like, your shit ain't working, right? So I have an electronics team that work with their electronics team to give them all the information because they were just like, yeah, we know it doesn't work. There's like seven other customers that tell us it doesn't work, but we keep asking for to give us certain information. They can't because they're just not sophisticated enough as tuners, right? So I had our electronics group go in there and give them all the information. Well, they, would, they, they needed data, right? Right. Well, they needed specific data. Right. Right. And, and you have to, all of our street systems are already on HP Tuner. So that's not a foreign system. It's not like we're going into something that we don't know. Like we know how to navigate the HP Tuner system for all sorts of vehicles very well. So it's almost like having a second set of HP Tuner eyes, but down in the garage to give them the information that they needed. So I don't know if you saw before UTV takeover, probably a week before HP Tuner is like, oh yeah, we finally got the, you know, we finally got the Pro R tune going, and we're just sort of like, well, thanks for the credit, guys, you know, but you know, uh, no problem. It's a no, team effort, but yeah, but you definitely have to put the R and D time. We, we with, definitely in the field. helped them unlock the door on that one. Yeah, right. It's it's still not foolproof. Like we still know where there's some glitches in there that they're working with us to get fixed. Um, but it's not. It, it's enough for us to show the prototype. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel where before it was kind of like, it's just like the same thing with Can Am with their latest updates. It's like the ECUs all got upgraded to this new generation, and then all of a sudden all these tuners that were normally providing flashes to the community um, and things like that all are like, okay, we thought we had it, now we have to wait. Okay, we thought we had it, now we have to wait. Um, and and that's growing pains, right? Uh, because the manufacturer they're just wanting to get a more robust system. So they have to eventually evolve into the bigger, more secure products, and they don't really want people messing with stuff. So, so there's an uphill battle for any tuner, um, and and but you you have the experience in the in the automotive world to have seen these hurdles before and know where to look and how yeah. to find and and that's the hard part. That's the that's the data side that a lot of people don't have experience in uh, when it comes to your random shop tuner or whatever. Yeah, I don't know sp specifically what things that we help them uh, resolve. Um, that's you met John the other day. Mm -hmm. Like John's the, the you know the, the, the buff the buff tuner guy, but. He's actually a genius level computer scientist type of guy, right? So what we have in the electronics uh, areas, you know, we could read chips, we could read, you know, we have scopes, we have all sorts of electronic testing equipment that we need. We have multiple dyno, dyno, dynos down there. And then we also use a bunch of other products too. So a lot of times you might be able to borrow strategies from somebody else that figured it out on a different platform right. for their own products and say, well, we know that the addresses, or you know, when I say address, I'm talking about breaking down the chip because you're basically reverse engineering where the program is on the chip, right. where the maps are on the chip. So we might have that information from other sources as well, right? So, yeah, it's like a, it, it's a team getting to where we need to go, whether it's been in the import industry or the UTV industry moving forward. It's a team effort. Yeah. It's people breaking it. It's people it's, building It's a community it. of de basically developers. Like we talk about the community in large, uh, in general, of our, everybody working together and help each other. I mean, we always say that anybody out on the trail is going to help somebody else on the trail and, yeah. and share a beer or whatever. Uh, but even more fine-tuned than that in the, in the tuning market, um, you know, there's, there used to be a day where it was like everything's secret, right? Like we're going to keep it for ourselves so that we can maximize our long tail profit on this. Yeah. Um, whereas over the last, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, things have gotten a lot more shareable, a lot more like togetherness involved with it. Um, and in the UTV market, there's a lot of ego involved, yeah. but I mean, you come from a world like the autom you can come the automotive world has full of ego. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you guys are used to that and you know how to develop and, and maintain those relationships and be uh, mutually beneficial to each other. Yeah, I mean, we can't fall victim to the small thing, right? You know, because there's things that you don't. I always tell people there's three categories of information. There's the things that you know, there's the things that you know that you don't know, and then there's the third body, which is the absolutely the largest body, is the things that you don't know that you don't know. You know, 
And that requires other people, other people's experiences, other people sharing their bad beats as well as their successes, you know, right. to fill in the blind spots, yeah. right? Within that, you, you can still have trade secrets, right? But the, the funny, the most of the people that think I got a secret, bro, trust me, it ain't a secret. <laughs> you know, like uh, we talk about 300M, this material, right? I, I think the off-road industry adopted 300M before the, uh, yeah. the on-road aftermarket. But 300M was made for landing gears for airplanes. That's what it was made for. So it, it wasn't like, imagine if the airplane industry, you can, I'm not telling you what my material is. Right. We wouldn't have that in the off-road industry unless it leaked out. Right. But it's material science. It's not that big a deal. Material People that sell materials want to sell materials. Right. So they, it's funny. The people that are secretive about the materials that they, that they use, they don't tell you what material that they use. But if you find the vendor, he'll give you the composition sheet, sheet right. and tell you how to heat treat it and how <laughs> and to where tell you, you how to finish it. it. Yeah. Right? So there's no, for the most part, there's no secrets. There's just things that you don't know. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. That, and, and I think that's what's important about shows like this where we can, we can explore those topics and, 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 and dive a little bit into it where then that spurs your spark and you can go and, and investigate what's going to be the best solution for you. Yeah. Like even in the automotive space, we, we use a lot of suppliers that are tier one, right? Meaning that they supply to all the OEMs, right? They have full engineering teams. Right. But we bring in a performance perspective that they don't get from the, doing the OE stuff. So it's like... Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, quote uh, the founder of Honda, Soichiro Honda. He said, racing improves the breed, right? So that's why Honda has always kind of been involved in all different forms of racing. I, you know, I, I, the, the U.S. motorsports efforts by Honda, I'm like, <laughs> but I'm talking historically. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm talking historically. And that's why, like, our tier one OEM partners, they like working with us because we're able to communicate to them in the same sort of, like, technical language. Right. But we're coming from we're the Adam Browns in their space, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so just so everybody knows, I mean, some of the some of the things that you've gotten into uh, that have taken off recently are are things like uh, the modern muscle car, the drifting cars, the things that actually, you know, they're not just banging gears through the race course. It's like high revving, high RPM, high abuse scenarios that are are kind of like a new industry for racing like being able to compete at that torture level is a different beast there's um i don't think there's any more shade tree successful racers like you know the racers that are competing at the highest levels you could be an amateur you could be self-funded or whatever but these are all very smart people with very methodical approaches to solving problems right so last night you know we were having having dinner you talked to pro drifter right it's not just burning tires it's it's like you got a 1,200 horsepower car that you're throwing in a corner at 100 miles an hour with 160 mile an hour wheel speed. That's how you get the big smoke. Right. And they aren't hard, hardened tires. These are the stickiest compounds you can possibly find. So it's like everything is pushed to the extreme. Right. Quick releases, how you, how you reinforce things, how you change the geometry. There's like if you're going to be successful in racing and performance, you got to be smart about it. Right. It's, it's one of those things like in UTV, the UTV space, we say that anybody can go out, like in a, in a takeover event, anybody can go race the big guys, yeah. and the big guys can race any of the small guys. It's a, it's a level playing field. But it's not really a level playing field because the experience, the knowledge, the, the application, the years of experience of putting the power to the ground all come at a very high cost of investing yourself over the years, yeah. right? And uh, you can't just throw money at something and expect to be on the top, but you have to have the, the guys the behind the scenes that are going to say, you know, let's hold off on that while we fix this problem. Like, like you were saying, just chopping the, the bottlenecks off one at a time. Um, you know, in a UTV, it's really easy to go all in on a motor build or a, a chassis build or something and assume the best. And then when you actually get to King of Hammers, you're hung up on a rock because you blew yeah. out something. It's, people like to... Okay, so the reductionist loser think is it's just the money game. I'm losing because the guy's out moneying me. Yeah. It's not. It's a knowledge game. Yeah. Right. And maybe they have more money because they actually have more knowledge to put that money to good use. Right. Right. So like in the racing that I've seen, I've always told people the difference that we've made, because, you know, I started this company out of my, my aunt's garage, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I lived in her little guest bedroom. Our advantage is like, 
if we're going to solve these problems and we have limited resources, how are you going to spend those resources to solve those problems? Some people will just throw stuff blind, just carpet bomb, right? And we've always been more like surgical strike. Like, let's use our heads. Let's identify which three trees we're going to chop as opposed to chopping down all the trees in the wrong forest. Right. You know? <laughs> no, I totally get that. And uh, I think that uh, people need to understand that it's not an unattainable, unattainable goal, yeah. right? You can get into racing. It's just you have to put the time in and find the right people and find the right team dynamic to make a successful program. Yeah. So, I, like, I can tell, and perhaps this is a, a word of caution to the enthusiasts in the UTV aftermarket. Like, I, I really don't even know a whole lot of people that, like, I compete against. I, I don't know who my competitors are. It's just like... We're just kind of doing our thing. You're focused. Yeah. We're just doing our thing. We have our strategy. We have our approach. And if, it, if it's good, consumers will vote on it as being good. Right. Right? Um, but there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. Yeah. You know, um, I've seen a lot of bad information being passed around the UTV space where it's just sort of like, no, the sky is not green. Right. <laughs> the sky well, is blue. And I, and I think that that comes from a place of lack of knowledge, right? They're saying... I, the only way for me to compete is to make these claims and put the product in front of people with those claims. Um, and it's really hard to decipher some of that sometimes, right? Yeah. And I think one of the best indicators is when they, when they really push a high output return uh, with minimal input, right? Like if you were having to expend only so many dollars and so much effort uh, and you're expecting to get X 100% of gain, you know, that might be a flag for you. But uh, whenever somebody says it's easy, that's the first flag because you don't know what they've put in to make that claim. Yeah. Um, and when we say something like a supercharge kit, we can say it's easy-ish. You're going to bolt it on without making engine modifications, and here's what you're expecting. But you're not coming out of the gate saying you're going to have a 300-horsepower monster by doing this base tune. You're saying you're going to make reliable improvements that you can feel when you're out driving yeah i like i didn't even like making horsepower claims like on our base kits we're just like okay it's approximately 40 or 50 percent increase because i don't know what things people are going to do to their cars how how jacked up it was to begin with and there is such thing as gifted engines too the ones that make more power from the factory because of core shift or whatever in the castings and you know has half a point more compression or you know maybe the injector or the head flows a little better because of how things shifted you, you, you don't know, right? So it's hard for me to say, yes, you're always going to make this because there's too many uh, unaccounted variables, right? You know, let alone the fact of how you measure or put into context that horsepower. Oh, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like come on, like <laughs> dyno numbers. Like, I don't even pay attention to dyno numbers. Everybody's dyno reads differently. And I can give you, a, I could write a book on how you can cheat a dyno, right? right? We use dynos purely as a b testing within our own development cycle right and if we want to get a number that's more akin to somebody else's number we'll just go use that dyno <laughs> we'll right. use the same dyno it's like okay now we know that so-and-so's dynos generally 15 percent off of ours and so-and-so's dynos eight percent off of ours and you know different things like that you know? yeah yeah the I, the way i tell it to people is if you're looking to do improvements on your experience not necessarily just horsepower or whatever your experience you know go after the thing that's going to make it feel and handle better uh rather than achieving a claimed number yeah like context is a huge part of our industry and people yeah. don't sometimes connect the two um and so when we talk about like the krx right it's like the first thing everyone goes is this is an amazingly built machine. It's capable, it's super heavy, super durable, uh, and then they're always following that up with the underpower claim. But it's just because they've set the bar of their experience level at a different place than what that product came out as. Yeah. And uh, I think it's unique that you're in a position to bring one vehicle the way it started as this, and then it comes out completely different, yeah. but yet nothing's changed physically with the car outside of the engine mod. It's funny on the KRX specifically, our marketing is like it, it, it. It's not this direct, but it basically says you know your vehicle's a pig, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know your vehicle's an overweight pig. Yeah, it weighs this much. Yeah, you know I could break down power to weight ratio numbers for you, but people don't you know understand that right. necessarily. So I'm just like you know it's heavy. Right. You know it's underpowered. Right. 
once you understand that, then you are one of our potential customers. If it's not, if you don't believe it, either of those things, stick with it. Yeah. It's good. And there's for people, you. there is a large, there, I want to say large, there's a segment of the market yeah. that they get these cars because they are slow and roll anywhere. Yeah. yeah. You can go anywhere, do anything. It's just, you're not going to go fast doing it. But there's the rest, of, there's the rest of the crowd that's saying, I want to be a part of the turbo crowd without being invested as an, in a turbo car. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about like a KRX and you want to put long travel on it, or you're talking about wanting to put an electronic shock solution on it versus, you know, uh, an analog solution, yeah. um, you know, you're always just adding more costs, more investment, and you don't want to necessarily, um, the most of us don't want to just throw money at it. Yeah. And so it, it's strategic understanding of what's going to make the best experience improvement is super important. And I think it's super important to get out to events like this yeah. and, and, and be able to put hands on something and talk to the people that know what they're talking about versus just the marketing group. Right. It's so like our sales pitch is just go drive it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just go drive yours, drive your buddies that has a supercharger kit on it and you can decide. Or if you're out here at an event, take a ride on one of our vehicles. You know, um, anything else that I say is just, Lip yeah. service. Like, yeah. just drive it. Feel it. The experience you know? is, is what sells. Right. And yeah. then over time, as your buddy's KRX supercharged, he's had it on there for a year and then no issues. It's sort of like, oh, I guess it is reliable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but right. hey, you missed out. For, you did, right. But that's the one part I kind of hope. You, please believe me. It's very reliable. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, I mean, you have years on the XP platform uh, being in the market. Um, and, uh, and now we're seeing that apply to the other motors and, and obviously the KRX isn't really very old. It's yeah. a fairly new product. Uh, but it's, it itself has, you know, reared its own problems, but, and then also its own reliability, yeah. uh, in the market. So there's, there's things to trust and, and, and you, every vehicle's different. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's all about just starting that, starting, getting in there, showing the proof is in the pudding and, uh, getting out in front of people. Yeah, so when we when we had the Razor um, Thousand XP kit, uh, we we put it on um, a racer. His name is Lesage, and he's he's one king of the hammers with a base kit, you know. And he's just a very smart racer, very meticulous, very methodical about his approach to setup and how he attacks the course. He won hammers with an X, XP One Thousand with a base kit with eight psi. It's not very much, <laughs> right. right? So that shows a certain level of reliability. And then obviously, because the, the Razor kit came out earlier, it really kind of proved out the system, the same system that we used on the KRX. So the KRX is benefiting from what we learned from, from, from the Razor. Right. right? With, and then all of the stuff is benefiting from the last 27 years in automotive performance. It's sort of like, yes, we are new to the UTV space, but we are absolutely not new to the game. Right. Right. And I think you want to find the guys that understand the game is more important than understanding a UTV space. Right. Because I can take the knowledge and I can so tell me what product gaps you think are missing in the market. And if it's something that falls within what we can do, we'll do it. You right. Know, so. No, it's super cool. So to kind of just wrap up the episode, uh, what does the future look like? What are we What are we putting out? What are we working on? Future's so bright, I got to wear shades. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're in Utah. It's just really bright. It's really bright. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really enjoying this second go around. You know, uh, first to go around when I was uh, 25, 24, 25, you know, playing with the import stuff. And now it's just sort of like, wow, I, I love the enthusiasm. I love that there's people sort of dumb hucking stuff all over the place. You know, it, it, it'll refine itself over time. Yeah. You know, uh, water finds its level, the cream rises to the top, whatever. I'm not worried about that. But having this opportunity to do it again, knowing what we know, it's really exciting it kind of reinvigorates the process it's really exciting and, and it's like i'm not and you're still learning stuff like yeah it's, i mean you've learned so much already but in a different application you're always going to find more weak spots more application changes and things like that so if if you look at the vehicles we brought out we brought out five supercharger you know with four supercharged and one one turbocharged vehicle right a year ago you probably never even heard of who we were right Lots of other people have heard of who we are in different spaces, but I think it's real impressive that in a short amount of time we can turn not o not only these five vehicles and the kits that are on there because it's just not putting a kit on there, right? We have to write instructions. There's a hundred, like let's say there's 150 parts in the bill of materials. We got to organize that. You know, that's where our experience comes in because 
people and 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 maybe this is a one of the things that you know the UTV uh, enthusiasts can benefit from is you can't just go for that little guy who comes up with the flash in the pan product. It takes organizations like well-organized, well-efficiently run. You, know, you got to have customer service teams. You got to have development teams. You got to have, you know, salespeople. And you got to have ethical management teams, right. right? In order to support industry that's growing quickly. Right. Because a lot of these guys that come out with the one product or two products, they may grow themselves to death, right? And I don't mean that physically to death. I mean, they can't handle, they will, they will, fall under the, their own success, the weight of their own success. There's, there's been multiple brands that have entered our market over the years yeah. and had good success, but because they never, they never grew out of the mom and pop, you know, garage mentality, they didn't have, like, they weren't business people in that as aspect. And so they kind of just killed their own product through growth. Yeah. And, and so it's super important to have companies. I mean, we look at big companies in our space, like Rugged Radios and, and other places that are fully invested in their teams and their staffing into their product, their sourcing, their shipping. I mean, there's so much to invest in, right? And if you're scared of investing, it'll show itself in the yeah. end. So uh, super, super important that a new brand to market bringing a large growth sector up is going to have to have a healthy understanding of that investment. Yeah, it absolutely takes or an organization, a well-run organization, in order to support the success and the growth of a, an exciting space like the UTV space. And we're fully confident in that. Because even though we're all in on the UTV stuff, we're still developing stuff for Toyota Supras and Audis and all these different things. We're still doing all sorts of 1,000 horsepower plus projects. You know, like, Right. Yeah. So. So with the Pro R, when the four-cylinder two-two-liter engine build, I mean, are you seeing a future with thousand horsepower UTVs? Man, that's crazy thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's a crazy thought, right? Like honestly, when we first put the supercharger on on the vehicle, the technician Charles he miscalculated the pulley size. So instead of having six pounds, which we brought out here, he had 14 pounds on there. And the second he got on the gas, it was doing a four-wheel burnout, <laughs> like going up the street on asphalt. And he's just like, oh, something. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's dial that down. But if you think about it, imagine what it'd be like with 40 pounds of boost in it. You know, it's ridiculous numbers. Right. So it's almost like we know what we can do in the two-liter four-cylinder overhead cam space because that's what we cut our teeth on, Right. So that proposition is very scary because, like, we supply parts and we're involved with engine builds, you know, four-cylinder Honda engines that are making 1,600 horsepower. They're splitting the blocks completely horizontally, splitting them in half. Like, wow, put that into an off-road vehicle. Into a lightweight it's, tube chassis. Like, the, 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 <laughs> the issue won't be power. Right. The issue absolutely will not be power yeah. and should not be power. Which is why I brought up earlier the powertrain or the drivetrain side of it. Um, and we're, we're looking at the possibility of seeing some of these new, these pro R's and X3's and stuff coming out with DCT's and stuff like that. Um, which ultimately, you know, takes away the simplicity of the drivetrain, but it also brings to the market a very, very powerful platform. Yeah. We're actually looking into doing all different gears for different platforms right now. Right. right? So we've, we, we've had experiences with race transmissions and gears and dog boxes and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So we're ready for it. And, you know, people have to be ready for that, too. I mean, every problem on the powertrain and the drivetrain side for the, the UTVs is solvable. Right. Right. It's sort of like the customer education, how you drive this thing, just using common sense, you know, and then also obviously safe chassis building. Right. You know, and I, I've, I've stressed that multiple times on this show is like you got to really consider the 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 horsepower, the ability versus catastrophe scenario ratio yeah. with these cars because it's getting to a point where our industry is growing to that point now where we're not being held back by like OEM investment anymore. Right. They've now provided the platforms where you can get scary fast. Right. So like if the Pro R, if its intent is to compete with trophy trucks, it needs to be as safe as a trophy truck. Right. Right. And I would much rather crash in a trophy truck For than sure. I would in a UTV. For sure. You know, so... Then comes weight. Right. You can't build a lightweight trophy truck. Right. You can build a lighter weight 
trophy truck, but you can't build a lightweight trophy truck. And so more power. So it's like safety, power, safety, power, safety, power. Right. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I definitely think that, uh, and, and I always say this, this caution is just check yourself, make sure you're not over investing and not investing in the right place. Like if you don't have the safety equipment in these big builds and things like that, you're putting your money, your money in the wrong place. Yeah. Like you got to start there. You got to make sure that you and your family or whoever is going to be walking away. Yeah, from the end of the day. Don't get hurt. Everybody don't. I get mean, hurt. even in your, in your, your automotive side, like they are very strict about making these cars safe. Like oh, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And we have SFI standards for like, you know, you have FIA, you have different, different racing sanctioning bodies have very strict standards and right. on the road. Yeah. And hopefully we see, the level of safety coming up along with you know suspension performance and as well as as uh, powertrain and drivetrain yeah we've yeah. we've benefited in our industry with the last 10 years of suspension development making things safer just by the fact that it can handle itself at high speed we're getting to the point now where especially like with the pro r suspension and, and the investments into some new stuff that'll be coming out over the next couple of years where you are literally going over three foot whoops at 100 at near 100 miles an hour off road, yeah. right? And uh, it's able to compose itself in that situation. Whether or not you're safe yeah. is a different story all day. Right. Your handling, your power, your drivetrain should all be built around your survival cell. Right. Right. You're ultimately, the cockpit is the survival cell. I don't care what form of racing, you know, Formula One, it's all like the driver cockpit, the survival cell has to withstand the craziest situations. You know, yep. So. And, and to, uh, we, we had a, uh, a video we put out here of our friend uh, Michaela uh, hucking his car off of a jump competition uh, a couple months ago yeah. and totally lawn darting it and tumbling six, seven times, whatever yeah. it was, at you know, 30 feet off the ground and literally just unbuckles, gets out of the car and walks away. But it's because of the investment into that platform, the, yeah. the safety platform that's within his chassis. Was he wearing a Hans restraint? He was a full custom fit seat with head restraint and everything. Right. See, so, I mean, like, so th those developments came out of road races. So we got to learn from each area. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, so you guys have some new products coming out. Uh, you, you're obviously working on the supercharged development cycle for these cars. That's the main focus. Yeah. Uh, and then you're getting a little bit into the CVT and, and that part of it. Um, and then you also have spring kits coming out and some other stuff. Spring so. kits, exhaust systems, uh, upgraded fuel systems, up, upgraded map. Like the things that you need to make. Uh, to make more power, we're developing kits so you could buy it a la carte because I don't, you know, we, we, we need the stuff if we're going to go high boost on the supercharger. Well, you could use it if you're going to go high boost on the turbocharger too. Right. And just, you know, no, don't, uh, just go let us do it. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> go look at the product and, yeah. and see for yourself. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and just speak to the exhaust side. Uh, a lot of people that are going to be interested in this episode are going to be KRX owners. Yeah. Um, and, being out with your KRX yesterday, uh, one of the common complaints with the KRX is the sound, the volume, the yeah. pitch, the pitch of the exhaust, and how and it lives at high RPM, right? Um, and then we were talking about gearing, and maybe that'll slew, s solve some of that in the future. But yeah. uh, but the 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 ability to take that kind of crazy, wild, high pitched whine that the KRX has and tame that down to a manageable level and a throaty level versus a high pitched level. Yeah. Uh, it actually was really pleasing to be around versus I'm glad you recognize that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I've been in there going, you know, f high gear down the dunes or whatever and just going, wow, my head's about to explode. So, so yeah. it's, it's legit. It's like, yeah, my mindset from just like pure efficiency and power, I don't care if it's loud, you know, it's like, I just want it, I just don't want it to be corked up. You don't want restriction when you're pushing a lot of power out there. But we listen to people in this space because I know there's just as many exhaust buyers that want something quieter. Right. So we have a high flowing titanium muffler with a straight two and a half inch straight through. So it's not choked down at all. And then we offer it in a, in a dual system as well. And it's not a, a Y going into two mufflers. It's not a two output. It, it actually loops. It's a double it's, chamber. It's, it's like it's extending the length of your exhaust system and putting two mufflers on it. Yeah, it's kind of like putting a resonator, two resonators in line right. and and shaping that output right. on the way out. And right. it, it sounded really good. And, yeah. it, and it does sound very aggressive when you're behind it. So it's not like you're, you're losing the aggressive side of it. Yeah. It's just you're losing the annoying side of it. Right. So I, I was stoked on that. So look at that. High quality. Looks great. 
Um, you know, and uh, obviously the supercharged kits are definitely something to look into if you're looking for more horsepower. You know, my uh, my brother's uh, uh, XP Turbo uh, is looking to get some more power and things like that. And that's a, that's a perfect scenario when we're talking about maybe some economic issues coming up ahead and things like that where you no longer are willing to throw 50 grand at a car. Yeah. Um, you know, you can salvage that, um, that previous investment by just bringing new life to it yeah. without without having to tear apart that reliable motor that got you by the last five years. Yeah. And so we're super excited about that opportunity and, and the market looking towards those aftermarket upgrades that are going to bring value back to the car and, and ultimately a new experience. You know, you don't yeah. have to spend 50 grand to get a new experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting times. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, we just hope uh, that your listeners follow us because I promise you we're, we're a great source of information. So where can we see the current availability of product and buy those and look at those? Uh, and then where can we follow the progression of, of these new options? We're, we're just building out the dealer channel right now. Um, with the supercharger uh, kits, we've sort of had pockets of dealers that are supporting the products in different areas. Um, it, it's not so much at a distributable product because you know it's really ex it's more expensive, and then generally we like shops that have hands-on experience so they can in install it or help you install it and things like that. But the general products like exhaust and springs and things like that will be building just a normal you know off-road UTV dealer channel, and so, so you should be able to get it pretty much anywhere at some point. So where can we follow you guys now? Where online can we we go and see these things, and then also how can we follow you? I think uh, I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think our Instagram is Craftworks Off Road. Correct. Yeah, and then we also have Craftworks USA, Craftworks which USA. That does com. street stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So is, start there. And is all the off road going to be available on the automotive website? No, but in, if you have an auto, <laughs> if you have a car and you're curious, yeah, you, know, you can yeah. look there too. And yeah. then. If you're a Honda guy, you could look at one of our other brands, Skunk 2 Racing, um, and just, you know, feel free to take a look, see what we do. You know, right. we'll, we'll put our money where our mouth is, and we got almost three decades of experience in the performance market, and we do our customers right. You know, yeah. it's like customers, we listen to our customers, we act on their feedback, and we make sure that we have good customer support to try to make it as painless and as good of an education there's actually a, somebody to call and, and answer the oh, phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's not just an email that goes nowhere yeah. it's not just a ticket that doesn't get no. answered so yeah. Uh, so yeah you can follow uh, uh dave and his crew over at craftworks usa uh i think the youtube is uh craftworks usa and yeah. they've been posting some stuff there for yeah. the for the off-road stuff so uh follow them they're gonna definitely not be going anywhere you guys are, are all in on this so yeah. Uh, look forward to that. Look forward to the to the to packages coming out because right now you you're starting at that baseline, right? You're you're establishing the normal yeah. baseline, and then and then things get exciting because yeah, you turn I, things I'm, up. Yeah, I'm not worried about it because we I, I know we're putting out great products and we'll continue to put out great products. And like I said, you know, water finds its level, cream rises to the top. So yeah. we'll be there. Cool. Well, there's a lot of exciting times ahead. Uh, I know from experience, there's some great experiences that we had with these modified cars. Um, and, it, and, and it's super cool to see a YXZ with a supercharger option where everybody's talking about turbos on YXZs. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of new, new things coming. Make sure to follow them. Uh, and uh, Craftworks USA, that's K, and it works with an E. Um, yeah. and, uh, but I'm sure if you just Google it, you'll find it. You can also find it on our website, as every episode does have a full link of all the pa uh, uh, page with all the links to everything we've talked about. Yeah. Um, so if you're curious on anything you've heard, you can go there and uh, get those links. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Radio, uh, iHeartRadio, all the different places, YouTube. And uh, I'm surprised you didn't even have a scar with you today. This is a this is a new experience. I've only seen you with a cigar with you. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think smoking's allowed inside the, <laughs> the rug rugged trailer. Rugged trailer, you know. <laughs> and, and and thanks thanks to Rugged Radios, they're one of our sponsors as well. Yeah. As, uh, so each of their cars have yeah. comms. Yeah. So as you're out riding and experiencing these cars, you can talk to each other and yeah. and all that. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us this episode. Uh, again, we're at Takeover uh, San Hollow, and uh, you'll there'll be a couple more episodes from this to follow. Uh, follow uh, Dave and his crew at Craftworks. Follow us on all the social medias, YouTubes, and give us a like if you can. And until the next time, peace.